I can tell from the way that uh, you've answered my questions so far that that you you take great care in um, sort of explaining to people kind of what's going on and helping the person on the other end of the conversation really really understand um, the, the 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 whole situation and so. What I'd like for you to do now is just talk a little bit more about that dynamic of your job. So I, certainly you've got to understand the fundamentals. You've got to understand the quantitative side. But at least for some clients, if you can't explain that into words that that that, that basically gets them to buy into what you're doing, then you're not going to keep your job. So 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 talk about the education piece, educating clients piece of your your job. And Eric, that's a great word. I'm going to say it this way. We have to be able to communicate with people and we have to be able to communicate effectively to get them to take action. And ultimately the action I'm wanting them to take is to hire me. So I'm never selling anything. If anything, I'm selling myself, right? But our ability to connect with people is so critically important. Um, You know, probably the two things that have really helped me grow my business the most. So we, I went fee-based in 2005. I started my firm in 2001. I went fee-based in 2005 and over the 15 years since 2005, we've, we're currently overseeing about $500 million, about a half a billion dollars of assets. Well, what's the number one thing or the top couple of things that have contributed to that growth? And I would say it's two things. It's, it's marketing and it's message. Uh, We're in an industry that, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I look at it opportunistically. We're kind of, you know, financial advisors, people are kind of wired to think, feel like we're a necessary evil. Like people don't trust financial advisors categorically. And I think the reason there's a reason for that. It's because up until the last 10 or 15 years, our industry has been very much a transactional based industry industry. Compensation has been transactional based, commission based. And in the last 10 or 15 years, you know, everything has moved more fee based. That's why I made the move in 2005. I saw that was where the industry was going. Then we got fiduciary responsibility. We got all these other things. So it's a much better way, in my opinion, to serve people. But that entire history of being transactional based has people pre-wired to think, okay, what's this guy going to want to sell me? But mm-hmm. people are hungry for answers. They're fed up with Wall Street and they're sick of Washington for sure. And so they're hungry for answers. So what I found early in my career is if I can get information out, I have an expression that at your outflow determines your inflow. If I can get information out and I can explain things to people that they've never heard before and I can explain it in a way that they can understand it, people are so hungry for that. And if I don't come across as self-serving, you know, I'm just helping them meet their goals. People are just so hungry for that. They're, they're just, mm-hmm. I can literally float my boat down the river here and the fish just start jumping in because mm-hmm. people are so hungry for it. So the marketing and message aspect, I know some really, really smart advisors, Eric, that struggle to make it. They're paycheck to paycheck because they got you got to get in front of people and you've got to be able to message effectively. Most people, as you mentioned in the industry, you know, most people in our industry decide they either want to work on the back office side. In other words, they want to be doing research, managing the portfolios in an office. And then you've got the client facing side, the people that are very relational and working with clients. I just love both of those things. I mean, I just love it. Um, You know, you're not normally going to see the lead advisor at a firm also be the chief investment officer. It's just not going to happen very often. I mean, it does, but it's not normal. I just love both, but it's okay to do one or the other. You're going to have, you're always going to have pieces of all of it, but any business in any industry has got to learn, has got to know how to get customers. They're willing to pay. So the way we get in front of people and the way we message to those people and the way we communicate to those people once they're in my office or on a virtual meeting, is just so critically important. I've got to differentiate myself from the competition. I think we've got time for one more, uh, one more quick question. 
Um, you mentioned earlier um, some, some some concern, well, concerns, but um, some realities that um, uh, research shows us that, that that people tend to 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 sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, make bad decisions um, when they're um, trading stocks or investing in mutual funds or or sort of. Uh, portfolio based decisions. I mean, the, the research is, is everywhere. I do research in this area. I mean, it's the, the, the numbers don't lie. Um, and so um, a, a huge, I think part of your communication role then is to, I don't know if protect people from themselves is the best way uh, to, to describe it, but um, maybe just educate people about what um, their emotions can do to them in this, this process of investments and planning. And can, can you give uh, maybe a, a quick example of what that looks like um, for, for you to, for you to serve people in that way? Yeah. So I think there's two keys there. One is you've got to have a plan in place. Number one, that will protect clients from the realities of market volatility and unpredictability. But then second, they need to understand how that's been put together and why it will work. So, you know, we everything we do here from a planning perspective on the research side and how we apply things, it's based on science and research. It's not my opinion. It's based on science and research. So it's rooted in, in, in those things. But then we have to communicate effectively with clients. So I'll just give you an example. If somebody's about to retire, and let's say this kind of a normal thing, their, their main assets, their 401k, maybe they got a million five in the 401k, and it's going to be the main source of income once they're retired to supplement Social Security. And they've got it fully invested in mutual funds. Now, it's probably a mix of stock and bond funds, but the reality is that portfolio is, is all at risk. None of those are guaranteed things. So what that means is when the market goes down, Let's say they retire and in the first year or two, the market goes down. We have a bear market goes down 40%. Well, they're going to have to sell when that market's down and spend that money. And we don't want them to have to do that. You know, that's fundamental in wealth management. Don't ever spend an investment loss. It's okay to reinvest a loss, but don't ever spend it. But if they're living on investments going up and down, then that's what they're going to do. And you know what? That's going to make them scared. Uh, I've had a lot of clients that came to me right after the Great Recession in 2008, or right after the pandemic hit in March, that we're planning on retiring in a year, and now we're like, Jim, I can't retire now, because they lost too much money, and they were depending on that money to draw income. So that money should not, that, that money, you know, when we're invested in the market, it's supposed to be for the long term. Now, that doesn't have to mean 30, 30 years, but at least five or more years. So in other words, people should then have other holdings that are safe or stable that they can depend on in the early years of retirement to draw from that's not in the stock market. Well, so think about that behaviorally. You know, if somebody came into my office right after the Great Recession and they're telling me I can't retire now. Well, it's because the behavior side of I, I, I can't realize those losses. If I handle that up front and have a good plan in place where it doesn't matter if the market corrects right before they retire, right after they retire, and they understand that, and, and we've measured the risk in a portfolio. You know, past risk in a portfolio is a pretty good predictor of future risk. So if they understand how their investments are likely to perform and why things don't, you know, Anything in the short term in the market shouldn't have a dramatic effect on your income. But in inflation in eight years, we got to get growth. Um, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but the communication element comes back to play. It's, it's making sure that clients understand their plan and how their plan's been constructed to meet their needs. And you make sure, and this is the last part, that you don't take more risk than a client's comfortable with. Okay, well, that was interesting. So we're, we're sitting here talking about uh, planning for, uh, you know, unexpected events and all these weird risk things. And right in the middle of that, uh, your, your power goes out. And so, uh, fortunately, you did have a plan in place. You've got a hotspot on your phone, so you're back on and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're winding down. But um, 
So it's almost the end of our time today. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say, Jim, thanks so much for, uh, for, for, for your words, uh, for your advice. I know you care a lot about your clients. Relationships are a big thing to you. Um, our, our students very much appreciate hearing from you every chance that they can. Uh, and then second, I just want to just uh, give it to you. And uh, uh, do you have a, a closing uh, word? One is uh, on saving money, start as early as you possibly can. Um, if you reran that scenario for somebody starting eight years earlier because of the compounding effect of the rule of 72, um, it'd be, you, you'd be pretty astounded at the difference in the amount of money that would have been saved by, I think Justin was his name. Um, the other thing I'll say is uh, behaviorally, when you're investing for the future, especially long-term, don't ever stop what you're doing, no matter what the market is doing. Keep investing. If anything, when we go through really, when everybody else is scared, figure out how you can put more money in. But definitely don't reduce your investing. And then the third thing I'll say is, as far as career goes, pursue what you're passionate about. Um, I mean, I know a lot of smart, talented people, but, but if they're not passionate about what they're doing, they're probably not going to be as successful as they want to be. And most importantly, may not be as happy as they'd like to be. So be, pursue what you're passionate about. And, 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 you know, it may take you a while to find that. That's OK. But whatever you're doing, do it with passion. So if you're in a role that is not where you want to be, but it's a stepping stone or it's a, a, an intermediary thing. Whatever you do, do it with excellence. Use my 95% rule. If you're going to do something, be great at it. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jim. Um, we'll, uh, I'll have you back uh, sometime. And be great. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue uh, talking then. Uh, be but glad until, to help. Until then, uh, thanks.